Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the late start here. Um, let's uh, begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to now invite up Rotarian Eric Erickson, who will facilitate today's invocation. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. Please bow your head with me. Lord, we ask that you bless this gathering today. Lord, you're always making things new. May you be present in every conversation that leads to new friendships. May you grant courage to every individual blessed with a new idea so they can be emboldened to create a new business. Lord, thank you for our community and for those who serve it and bless those in need of our service today in our city, in our state, and around the world. In your name, amen. Thank you very much, Eric. <clears throat> well, what was normal protocol prior to COVID was uh, we would go around the room and Rotarians would introduce their, their guests. Um, last week was the first time we did that since before COVID, and so we're going to begin and continue with that, uh, that tradition. So I am going to call on a number. We have a number of guests today. So I'm going to call on a number of Rotarians to introduce your guests. If I happen to miss somebody, please raise your hand and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get the, the mic circulated to you. So, so very good. Eric's got Eric's ready to go. So the first uh, guest we have is uh, Gary um, Dipsetter. Dipsetter. Mr. President, I'm pleased to introduce a new commercial services officer, Vice President of Commercial Services, Brian Egbert. He's re relocating from Champaign, Illinois area and coming to God's country here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Very good. Welcome, Brian. <laughs> and Eric Erickson, you have a guest today. President Jason, fellow Rotarians, it's my honor to uh, introduce Nathan Hofer. Many of you probably know Nathan from other roles in the community and universities uh, at Friends of SDPB. We're glad to have him as our manager and doer of all things related to outreach and events and uh, just getting more involved with the communities that we serve at SDPB. So please welcome Nathan Hofer. Very good. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you for joining us. And Rotarian Knock Thatch, you have a guest with, with us today. It's a pleasure to introduce to everyone Peter Hauk, Community Manager at um, Startup Sioux Falls, which recently just rebranded. He is the cheerleader and um, a very well-spoken um, component of the Startup Sioux Falls team. So please welcome Peter. Rotarian Kathy Thorson, you have a guest with us today. President Jason and fellow Rotarians, please join me in welcoming Senior Vice President Keith Portner from Central Bank. Welcome, Keith. And Tom McDowell. There he is. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, President Jason. I'm pleased to introduce my daughter, Olivia. She, uh, Olivia joined my firm, McDowell Financial Group, about six months ago. So welcome, Olivia. Thank you. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you. All right. And for those Rotarians out there, if you have guests here that I perhaps missed, uh, please uh, raise your hand. If not, three. 
You are mic'd. You can come up here. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge uh, two other of our staff members that are here today. So we've got Sarah Lum, um, who is the program uh, Programs and Marketing Manager at Startup Sioux Falls, as well as Barb Glazier, who is our new bookkeeping and administrative assistant. All so. right. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome, Barb. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, now, uh, with another 50 minutes to go, we got a lot of material to cover today. I will turn it over to Rosarian Cindy Peterson. We'll moderate our guests, Matt and Bree. Um, quickly, to just do a quick brief introduction, um, both Bree and Matt are Rotarians of downtown, uh, downtown Rotary, um, but I want to do a quick introduction quickly of both of them. Um, Bree is the executive director of Startup Sioux Falls, uh, formerly Zeal, um, an ecosystem organization that empowers founders by offering resources to network, launch, and grow their ventures. Brian leads a small but mighty team of four, is a member of the One Million Cups Innovation Expo and Hey Sioux Falls Organizing Committees. She's both a proud mentor and mentee. She has been recognized in Prairie Business Magazine's 40 Under 40, a graduate of the sixth class of Leadership South Dakota, serves on several educational advisory boards, and was honored by the Sioux Falls Police Department with an outstanding citizen award for their work and advocacy of the downtown neighborhood. Above all else, Brian cares deeply for the people in her community and is proud to call Sioux Falls home, along with her husband, Brian, and her beautiful daughter, Pearl Jane. Please join me in welcoming Brian Manor. <laughs> Rotarian Matt Paulson is the founder and CEO of MarketBeat, a financial media company that empowers individual investors to make better trading decisions with real-time financial news and best-in-class stock research tools. With more than 2.3 million active subscribers, MarketBeat is the largest digital media company in the Dakotas. Over the last several years, Matt has made substantial contributions to the growth of South Dakota's startup ecosystem. And in 2019, he founded Startup Sioux Falls, which has since become the premier resource organization for startups founders in the region. He was instrumental in the creation of the Falls Angel Fund, which makes early stage investments in high growth companies in South Dakota and surrounding states. He is also the namesake of Dakota State's University's Paulson Center, which aims to accelerate faculty and student-led startup businesses. Well, there's a lot more that we could be said that could be said about Matt. He cares deeply about the community he lives in and helping those around him succeed in business and his family, Kareen, Michael, and Adeline. Please join me in welcoming Matt Paulson. All right, Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Here we go. Thank you both for being here. It's fun to share the stage with both of you today. Bri, I'm going to start with you. I imagine if we asked every single person in this room how to define an entrepreneur, we would get a variety of answers. You are going to be our expert on this definition. Describe an entrepreneur and what is the definition of a startup? Yeah. So an entrepreneur is a person with an idea who is looking to introduce a new product or service into the marketplace. And the defining term of that is that they may or may not succeed. They, they've got the idea, they're kicking it around, they're gonna see where they go with it. Whereas a startup is, um, they're, they're a sol they can be a solo entrepreneur, but they are looking to scale up their venture um, and, and create an, an even stronger business model through the process of, of becoming a startup. So they're a little bit further in the process, I guess you could say, whereas an entrepreneur maybe just has an idea they're kicking around. So there really is a distinct difference there between is. the two. There is. Matt, I'm curious, do entrepreneurs see themselves as entrepreneurs? Did they identify with that, that label? Yeah, that's an interesting kind of loaded question because there are all these different labels that people that start things use to describe themselves there's founder, there's entrepreneur, there's um, small business owner, freelancer, designer, developer. And some people identify with some of those words, but not others. And there's also this really interesting thing in our industry called imposter syndrome, where people don't feel like they've achieved enough to kind of own that title of entrepreneur. Um, it's something that I dealt with. Um, I started my business in 2006, 2007, but I really didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur for probably about five years into it. So what we try to do at Startups Who Follows is really use inclusive language that applies to kind of the most people and say, hey, if you are trying to start a business of any kind, we're here for you. 
So kind of the word we've landed on is just founder. Are you a founder of something? Did you make something new? Did you create something? Did you start a business? Did you start a nonprofit? So if you are that person, you are a founder, and that's kind of how we've been talking to people is with the word founder. It's also easier to say and spell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to say, too, that entrepreneurialism is a mindset in addition. So what Matt just said about imposter syndrome is a real thing. Um, and we see entrepreneurial um, mindset as someone who's more willing to take a risk, um, who, who believes in what they're doing, and they're willing to, to do whatever it takes to get that to happen. So I do see, um, I think everyone in this room can benefit from an entrepreneurial mindset, whether you have started your own company, or whether you're working for a company that is going through some massive shifts, which I think we're all enduring that right now. So it's just something to keep in mind that that's something that we encompass as an organization as well as is helping to develop that mindset. Well, and Matt, you said that you didn't identify personally as an entrepreneur till a certain point. What was that switch for you? Um, it was probably, you know, but there was a point when my, my, side, my side business at the time was making twice as much as my day job. And I realized, that, you know, I could really make a go of this. Mm -hmm. This is who I can be. It's kind of like when I realized the business would support me, like, oh, I am that guy. Almost one of the last ones to figure it out along the journey. Yes. <laughs> Bree, I've yet to meet a successful business person, a successful entrepreneur who describes how he or she made it all the way all by themselves. They did it all on their own. And now it seems that there's even more and more support and resources out there to assist those who are striving to start a business. Mm -hmm. What does the center where you work, what does mm -hmm. that have to offer? Yeah. So when we're talking about the center, um, that's our, our physical space, mm -hmm. yes. um, which is an interesting concept now that we've de dealt with the pandemic and, and remote work and what does that look like moving forward. But currently, while we're still in our, our Zeal Center for Entrepreneurship facility, we offer things like shared meeting room space, um, spaces to hold a Zoom meeting. Um, you can have a co-working membership. So if you need a, a space to work that's not in your home where your screaming kids might be right now, that's, that's something that we offer in our current facility. We have high-speed internet. We have shared copier. We have you know just some of those little amenities like a mailbox if you need one. Um, so at, at Zeal Center, with those physical amenities, we have seen an interesting shift in need, which is why we're exploring and, and you know, deciding that we need to kind of break out of that model and look for something different. Um, beyond the physical amenities, we also offer a community of people that really help support those that feel like they're on their own because a lot of, a lot of them are solopreneurs that are just starting out and they're one person mm -hmm. and they, they just need those resources to survive. So that, that's the other piece of what Startup Sioux Falls, the organization provides is that community of experts um, to let you know that you're not alone and to help people acclimate to the business community here in Sioux Falls. So the center itself can be a place of infrastructure. Yes. Even having, that's where your address is. Right. You're officially a business because it's, you have an address and right. it's not the address that you live at. Exactly. But yet, so that the resources piece and then that infrastructure piece is a Correct. powerful combination. Correct. But there are many resources available that didn't come out of the institution or stem from an institution. Mm -hmm. And Matt, you've been a part of a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Talk about ideas and efforts that are led by individuals like yourself, mm -hmm. or maybe led by uh, Eric Weiser, who was identified as Entrepreneur um, Champion of the Year. Talk about some of those efforts that came out from other entrepreneurs who were looking behind them to look forward. Yeah. Um you know, today we, we've got an awesome startup ecosystem organization, Startups Who Falls is kind of the central hub for all that stuff. Uh, that was not the case uh, five years ago. Um, at the time, the Zero Center for Entrepreneurship really was trying to be an accelerator facility where businesses would come in office at, and then the businesses that were tenants there would receive services from the Small Business Administration, the Small Business Development Center, and whoever else that was kind of, um, you know, part of that organization. Um, but it wasn't trying to be the broader ecosystem organization that would kind of incorporate uh, community and education and mentorship and um, access to capital and all of the things that make up a startup ecosystem. Uh, so where some of those gaps were, 
Um, some of the rest of us kind of stepped in um, to try to create some of those resources. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, John Meyer started One Million Cups in 2014. Um, I was a big part of getting Falls Angel Fund off the ground. Eric Weiser is probably the most prolific angel investor in our, in our state. He's done over 100 deals. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, but, you know, some of these other things were really kind of try to build out the ecosystem. And over the last kind of three years or so, Brian and I have really, actually two years, um, have really worked to kind of bring, uh, bring some order to that chaos and try to put it under the Startups Who Follows umbrella. So like one million cups, the finances and everything kind of run through Startups Who Follows now. And Startups Who Follows is really kind of becoming that hub organization that embodies that mentorship, that community, that education, kind of all of those things under a single organization. So when somebody says, I want to start a business, what do I do? You go to Startups Who Follows. Brie, can you tell us a little bit about what One Million Cups is and how that's valuable to an entrepreneur? Yeah, absolutely. So the program itself was based out of the Kauffman Foundation, which is part, uh, part of who owns and operates the, the mechanism. So across the country, there are One Million Cups events in different chapters. So we're, we're a cha one of you know thousands of chapters across the country, which is kind of cool. The name One Million Cups came because all of these events typically start at 9 a.m. So we're all having coffee and we're having One Million Cups. But really, but the, the the premise behind the event is to to create that community and to tell the stories of the entrepreneurs that are in your community and and beyond to try to trigger more activity in that nature. So um, every week at 9 a.m., we have a different entrepreneur that will tell their story. We also offer an opportunity for those in the room to introduce themselves and just make some connections. And along the way, I know that there have been job offers that have been made in the room. Um, you know, just it, it's just a chance for you to, to physically tap into the ecosystem and see who's in it and, and what it's all about. So and it's one of the most consistent networking events that we have in our community because we do it every Wednesday at 9 a.m. barring a couple of months. So it's it's been a great opportunity to implement a program from the outside in that those that aren't from here are familiar with. So it's an easy way for them to it's one point of entry, I guess, into the ecosystem. And we've been going for what eight years now, mm -hmm. so it's it's been a fantastic venture for us um, collectively. But you know, Startup Sioux Falls is proud to to be at the helm of that. And who's the target audience in terms of who presents, and who's the target audience in terms of who attends? Yeah, so who presents varies, and again, the definition of, definition of entrepreneur is. Um, we're trying to become more inclusive of what that is. So we've had everything from breweries to tech startups. Um, we're trying to celebrate those new businesses that are coming to town. And if there's an established business that has a new, you know, they're, they're scaling up and they have something new to offer, we want to share those concepts as well. But it's also important to bring people in from the outside. And a big win that we had about a year and a half ago, we brought in the CEO and founder of Tofurky, Foods, which is a, a vegetarian um, product, but he's he's a notable entrepreneur, and we brought him in to tell his story and talk about what plant-based means here in our city. So it's it's a great opportunity to introduce people to new to new ideas, new concepts, um, and and see where things go from there. But um, first and foremost, we're always looking for people in our own community to share their stories of success, and you do have to have been in business. For one year, uh, is that right? That was the rule one time. One I, don't think it's kind of, I don't think it's being enforced currently. <laughs> there, there are no rules at One Million Cups. <laughs> no rules for entrepreneurs, just, they're gone. Which is part of the fun of being an entrepreneur. Is exactly. You get to help create some of those exactly. rules, truly. Yep. You know, Matt, when I think about Sioux Falls Angel Fund, Pitch Night, all the things that you have personally put time into, mm -hmm. creating, yeah. sustaining, your business sponsors a lot of those things mm -hmm. to allow them to flourish. Why are you so personally invested in the startup community? Uh, I think there's two things I could point to. Uh, one, when I started my business up at Dakota State in 2000, it was December 26, 2006 was the date. Um, there weren't a ton of resources available and the resources that did exist, like how does a sophomore at DSU learn about the Small Business Administration in Sioux Falls? It just, you really don't know what's out there. And uh, I just want to create resources for people that were in a spot I was in 15 years ago and kind of give them the resources that I wish I had at the time to get my business going. I think it would have gone a lot smoother and a lot quicker um, had I realized there were um, you know, resources like Startups Who Follows out there 
And also just kind of a ton of online resources that exist now that didn't this, you know, exist then. I could have gotten it going way faster. Um, so part of it is wanting to help out the next generation. Uh, another part of it is just really, I feel like it's something that I can make an impact in. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways to volunteer in our community. Everybody in this room volunteers, um, you know, in some way or another. And, you know, everybody can serve on three or four boards, go to meetings. And at the end of the day, you know, it's hard to, to kind of measure the impact that you make. Um, but everybody has like one industry or topic or category like they have a superpower in. And I feel like, you know, creating startup community is one of my superpowers. So um, I'm going to put my time and energy into the thing that I can make a big, big impact on versus the things where like maybe I could be on a board or make some kind of impact. But this is the thing that I know that I can make a big impact on. Uh, so I put a lot of time and money into it. I can attest to that, having <laughs> Matt on my board of directors. You can't ask for a more engaged, passionate, giving board board member. It's just been a pleasure getting to know him and working with him. We, I don't know what we would do without you. So, and I, I loved what he said too about paving paving a smoother road for the generations ahead. We both have kids, so that's probably at the top of our mind. Like, how do we make things easier and more accessible for our kids? And that's really at the heart of, of why I do what I do. Um, and I'm just glad to share that vision with Matt moving forward. So it's safe to say Matt is truly a part of the community. Yes. What does that word community mean? We talk a lot about, um, the, we talk about the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial community. What is that all about? Yeah, um, whenever they do those word bubbles where you talk about how many times you've used a word in a year, that's always like my top word. It's my favorite word. Um, and it, it can mean so many things, but in the ecosystem, the, the startup businesses and the founders truly couldn't survive without a community because again, they're one person and one person doesn't have all of the skill sets that it takes to start a business. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they need a community to find those resources, access to capital, um, just somebody to bounce ideas off of and let them know that they're not alone and that they're not crazy. Um, you know, I think especially in this past year in a time of isolation, it was so incredibly important that we continue to find some semblance of community. So we, we, you know, we have, we had zoom events, you know, that was really the way to stay connected. Thank God that we have this, this really powerful, uh, Facebook group that's full of over 7,000 startups, entrepreneurs, and enthusiasts that are able to connect with one another and help each other out. Um, I can go on and on, but it's really been fun to come back together in person and understand the power of, of being in a room with someone else and the energy that, that comes from, from interacting with a human being in person. So we're getting back to more in-person events. We, we host uh, quarterly mixers. We have educational events. We'll probably continue to, to do the Zoom thing because we've been able to connect with people that we wouldn't have been able to in the past, whether they're rural or they're from another state and they're, they're plugging into what we're doing. So in a way, we were blessed, you know, by, by having that challenge. But at the end of the day, it's all about community. That's, that's the most important thing that we do as an organization is cultivate that community and that we truly understand who the players in the community are. So making sure that we're abreast of everyone in the ecosystem, like Matt said, making, you know, taking order out of chaos. You know, there's just, there's a lot of points to entry. There are a lot of folks that are, that are in this space trying to help out and we're just trying to make it easier for them to navigate. You look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that like, it's really cool about the community. It's, it's almost um, like our online Facebook group is almost kind of a Google for entrepreneurial skills and resources in our community. Um, like people ask me questions and I say like, I don't know the answer to that, but you could go on Facebook group and ask a question. And then like within an hour, like 10 people will comment like, oh, you need a custom woodworker. You should go talk to this guy. He's great. And um, so that, that gives people access to just, just a broad set of, of other people and skills and knowledge that like it is really a Google for like entrepreneurial resources in Sioux Falls. And it's just, it's a very useful useful thing. We are literally walking Rolodexes. I love it. And I'm dating myself by using that word, I realize, but. I know it. Who, everyone know what a Rolodex is <laughs> yeah. in the room. I think it's a pretty safe crowd for Perfect Rolodex. Perfect opportunity to say, what's a Rolodex? <laughs> what's a Rolodex? <laughs> that is not on my list of questions. But it's, um, the way you describe it really triggered for me. In my office, we talk about there's no such thing as a well-rounded person. 
And so you must build well-rounded teams. And this ecosystem, this community, to me, feels like you just described that for the entrepreneurial, um, that entrepreneur or that startup. Is that, am I making that connection? Yes, that is absolutely the case. You don't want to, I mean, we want, we want our community to be inclusive, but we're also intentional about how, who we want to be included in the community yeah. to make sure we're not missing something. It's like when you, when you have a board of directors, well, do we have a lawyer? Do we have an HR person? You just want to make sure that you have all the right people at the table and that you're engaging the right people in the process. Well, and what I was, uh, one of the things I was excited about today is that while there's a variety of knowledge and experience about the organization in the room, that one person, those three people who hear something new to, today and say, wait a second, I could play a part in that. That's a place where my expertise could be, or they even reflect back on their own journey. Um, I think that's a neat connection that perhaps could come out of today. We're inviting everyone to be a part of the, the ecosystem and right. part of that community. And that's why we launched a mentor network, to be honest. You know, mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that the Kurt Loudenbecks of the room who have started their own business that have been through hell and back are able to come and shit and sh yes and back. You're back from hell. <laughs> um, but are, are able to share their knowledge. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's really important. So I, I mean, everyone who's listening right now, I want you to know that there's more. You're you're more than likely you have some sort of a, a a tool, a talent, a treasure that we could use in our met mentor network. So reach out to us if you want to share. Well, in this ecosystem, this entrepreneurial ecosystem had a big day a couple of weeks ago with the announcement that Zeal and Startup Sioux Falls, that initiative, that it would merge together and the way I've described it as an entrepreneurial powerhouse. That's a lot of silver. That sounds good. So, Bri, I want to start with you. And then, Matt, I'd love for you to jump in. Give this room some insight on how all of that came to be and what it looks like. I don't know. I blacked out. <laughs> Entrepreneurial <laughs> powerhouse. <laughs> um, I, I have to give a, a ton of credit to our team. I, we couldn't have done this without the incredible team. And by team, I mean both the staff of Startup Sioux Falls and all of our, our community. I don't even know what we're calling them now. Our ecosystem organizers. Community builders. Community builders. Mm -hmm. um, and a ton of them are in the room today. Um, but I, I don't know how we did it. Um, but it went off without a hitch. It was a seamless, and, and I'm talking about the aesthetic side. So we rebranded. We have a new mark, which I'm wearing one of the cool pins. We have swag. Shout out to Amy Moore for that one. Sh yes, shout out to Amy Moore. Absolutely. She's on our board of directors. Um, we completely overhauled our website, which wasn't a small feat. Um, and we just, everything just came together and everything ac accumulated the night of the Hey Sioux Falls event where we made mm -hmm. our big announcement and made a big splash. Um, so again, we couldn't have done it without the team. So thank you all, Knock, Peter, Sarah, Barb, Maureen, who's not here. I mean, there was a ton of people involved in that process. It takes a village. So let's back up one step. Yep. Why? Yeah. <laughs> You know, there's probably value for the two of them be, to work together in parallel, but now they come yep. together. What was that conversation? How did that decision come to be? Matt, do you want to take yeah. a stab at it? Yeah, there's a, there's a the long why? history there. Uh, it wasn't always smooth, um, but really what it amounts to, um, so when I, well, Startup Falls actually found in 2017, didn't get off the ground. In 2019, I got really inspired to do more, and that kind of led to the launch of Startups to Falls. At that time, Zeal was in between executive directors. There wasn't a lot of programming or really anything happening for startup founders. And I said, we sh people need help now. Like, I'm not going to wait two years to start helping people. Uh, so that kind of led to the launch of Startups to Falls. Uh, Burian um, uh, showed up on the scene a few months into that, and uh, we had many discussions over the summer of 2019 and in the fall. Like, we kind of landed like, okay, it doesn't make sense for there to be two separate organizations doing similar things in Sioux Falls. Um, you know, having nonprofits that overlap in Sioux Falls is kind of a long-standing problem that Cindy could talk about better than anybody. Uh, and we didn't really want that in the startup space. Um, we knew we would be stronger if we combined efforts. Um, you know, for the organization to be successful um, in the future, it really needed to combine the best ac aspects of Zio and the best ac access aspects of startups Sioux Falls into one organization. And Brienne's, you know, at the helm of Startup Sioux Falls, and she has has done a fantastic job of being that nonprofit leader, um, kind of br to bring the organization forward, and you know, keep people like me in line who would probably just 
piss a bunch of people off if I were doing it by myself. So uh, Burian has just been a great asset to kind of lead the team forward and kind of take all these different elements and bring them together under one umbrella. And um, you know, it's been the right direction, continues to be, and continues to evolve over time. And Startup Sioux Falls is just a great name, let's be honest. Like, we want people to start in Startup Sioux Falls. There are many organizations across the country that call them themselves startup whatever. So it just makes sense. And I also love that we have a, a stronger alignment with our ecosystem organization partners, such as the Chamber, um, the Development Foundation, which are the groups that founded us initially. They, they created a tech council and said, we need this thing in Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. So we're paying homage to that as well. You know, just being a little bit more cohesive in our efforts. Not that we all have to be completely aligned in what we're doing because we all have our different missions and, and values and, and, and things that we want to accomplish, but to have a more... I don't know, a streamlined approach um, to, to the city's economics, I think, is really important. Absolutely. And it seems to me that things change because needs change. You know, I think back to, I'm a month from celebrating 11 years of maximizing excellence. And on August 4th, 11 years ago, I walked in the doors of the South Dakota Technology Business Center, which is what Zeal was called a decade ago. The SDTBC. Um, and um, I could never have gotten where I am today without that. But some of the th resources that you describe sound and feel a lot different than the resources I needed 11 years ago. How have the needs of an entrepreneur or a startup evolved in the last Yes, for me, last decade would be where right. my journey began. How's that changed? Well, we chuckle about the SDTBC, but there was a lot of foresight put into that facility and the premise behind it. I'm so grateful that our city was smart enough and innovated, innovative enough to know that we needed to uh, commit some funds and some time into the, the startup ecosystem, which at the time was very tech focused. Rich Nazer is in the room. He can talk about it. He, he was at the helm for longer than any of us. Um, but there, there was a certain type of need at the time where you couldn't just go to a coffee shop and plug in. You needed the, the high-speed internet. You needed shared copier services. You needed a mailbox. You know, there were just some things, um, tangible things, um, that, that, that needed to happen. And, you know, as over time, things evolve. And entrepreneurs especially, they're not going to wait for you. They're going to continue to innovate, and if they can't find it, and if you don't have it, they're going to go find it somewhere else. So it's really important that we stay abreast of what those needs are, and everyone in this room can attest to it again, like I go back to the pandemic, but it was a wake-up call for everyone to say things have changed. It, we live in a much more con co connective environment where you can work from home now. We have 5G, you know, we're, we're able to do that. So what are what what is our what is our need in the community today? What how do we need to serve entrepreneurs differently? Well, we need to talk to them first of all and get and get their perspective. Um, but we know that some of the the physical amenities in our space are a little outdated. It's 15 years old. So that's that's a huge opportunity that we have in the next 12 to 18 months is to figure out what that physical space looks like in addition to what are those other resources that we need to bring to the table to take us into the next 10 to 20 years, which is exciting. It's awesome to be a part of this, but it's also a lot of pressure. <laughs> because like you said, it goes fast. It does. Because they're not going to wait, so you nope. got you to go with them. Yep. Matt, anything you would add to that evolution of the needs yeah. of an entrepreneur? Yeah, the needs have totally changed. Um, I mean, who doesn't have a no home office now, right? Um, you know, nobody prints anymore. Nobody really is that concerned about where your physical mail shows up. Everybody's got high speed internet. Um, you know, you can go sit at Josiah's or Queen City Bakery um, and sit down, have fast internet, have better food than you're ever going to get at a co working space. And like, the needs have, have, have totally changed away from the space and toward the services and the education and just the mentorship and, and kind of the soft stuff. Yeah. And um, like the, the team at Startups Who Falls, Brian, Peter, and Sarah and Barb have just done a great job of, of, of really owning that. And uh, they launched uh, Co-Starters, which is an, a new accelerator program. They've already had two cohorts. How many people have gone through it? About 30. 30, yeah. So we've had 30 people this year alone go through this process where they evaluate uh, kind of the quality of their business idea, do some market research and really kind of get it from that idea stage to 
ready to start the business stage. And really, we need more stuff like that in the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because I've personally gotten a little bit more involved in some of the entrepreneurial things that are happening in our community in the last year or so, but I feel like I'm, so I maybe am just hearing it because I'm in it a little bit more, but I feel like everywhere I go, there's a conversation about startups and entrepreneurialism more than ever before. Yeah. Is it just me? Is it, a, is it trendy right now? What is that? I'd like to think our team has a lot to do with that because I think over the past year, especially we've been, we've been sharing the story. And that was something when I came onto the organization that was, was said that wasn't happening. People were confused about what zeal center was and what's an entrepreneurial ecosystem. There were all these buzzwords and acronyms. So we're just trying to make sense out of it, if anything else. And the best way to do that is to continue to drive that message home. You know, having opportunities like this to sit on a stage and, and tell you all about what we do, it's powerful. So we need to continue to, to run that, that economic engine. Um, nationally, the industry is being talked about more than ever because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's a piece of legislation that the Senate passed pretty bi bipartisanly for $1.3 trillion of infrastructure, which includes um, high, money for high-tech industries, and I'm using my notes here so I don't screw up, but semiconductor chips and the develop, development of AI. You know, this is something that is in the national spotlight, the international spotlight. We have to compete with China. We have to compete with all these other countries that are doing really, really inventive things. Um, and how does this relate to the work we're doing? Well, recently I met with uh, the director of innovation at the city of Sioux Falls named Mike Grigsby. And if you have not had a chance to meet this man, you need to. He is incredible. He's doing incredible things. He has implemented smart cities across the globe. And it was he was very adamant when we met that a healthy, vibrant, and growing startup community is the key to sustaining the city's growth and evolution, preventing and preventing our city's success from becoming just a single city boon. And I have to share some of these notes for, for you because they're fantastic. Um, but some of the things, the, the outcomes, the additional benefits that, that we see for investing in a healthy development of our startup community include creating multiple channels for promoting the startup community, giving opportunities to launch organizations that can create a type of startup operating system to, to drive and ensure success, um, creating new and novel investment opportunities for foundations and other common money channels, um, the startup community will spill over into other areas of need in the community. So we think about the di digital divide. There's, there's opportunities to create a tech council. We have food deserts, public health and safety, workforce development. All of these things relate to what we do. Uh, entrepreneurs in the startup community can be an, ec an economic driver for the city through social events like the happy hours, the pitch events, all of those things that we do, we're, we're drawing people, we're drawing attention to our city by bringing people in from the outside. I can tell you that because we just attended Entrefest down in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which no one would think that that would be the hub of entrepreneurial activity, but man, was it impressive. And I want, like, I came back and all I want to do is show off our incredible city and especially our downtown and bring a bunch of innovative minds down and, and see what we can accomplish. Um, and last, entrepreneurs can leverage their worldwide networks to draw attention to attractive investment and drive more growth to our city. I just love that there is someone at the helm of the city and it, not just him, our mayor, who is an entrepreneur himself, so many in this room who have thought that, that, that understands the value of what we're doing in this community. I'm just, I'm so excited for the future and having these conversations with city leaders. We are just, we have such an opportunity to pivot here mm -hmm. and I, I, I can't wait. Well, Matt, I think we touched on this a little bit, but I, I love taking a piece and, and showing how it fits into the big picture. So I'm gonna bring this your way. Why does what entrepreneurs are doing matter to the people that are in this room? or matter to Sioux Falls and our economy? Well, I, I think if you look at uh, some of the companies that are a big deal in the state of South Dakota today, you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, they were startups. Um, you know, I think of Jeff and Rob Broin, the Broin Brothers, you know, Poet was a startup at one point. Uh, Dectronics was a startup at one point. You know, DocuTap Xperity was a startup not that long ago, and now over 100, you know, employees in the city and you know, there, there's kind of these three legs of economic development. There is kind of the business recruitment, that's what the Development Foundation does, and they obviously do a great job with that. 
There is kind of the providing services and advocacy to existing businesses. And that's what the chamber does. And then there's kind of this new business formation, kind of three legs of the stool. And that's kind of what we do. And what is um, kind of really, really interesting about the new business formation stuff is that the jobs that are created from small businesses that come out of the city, uh, you know, they tend to they tend to stick around. They tend to pay pretty well. Um, you know, I don't remember what the stats are, but just a, a big chunk of jobs are you know come are through small businesses. Um, you know, if you look at the top ten employers, like yes, they employ a lot of people, but there are a ton of small businesses that employ just as many people, if not more. And you know, really to have a vibrant economy, that's, we we can't just lean on kind of the big pillars of the community. And obviously that, you know, Sanford and Avera and Premier and, and the like do a ton of great stuff for Sioux Falls. But if we want Sioux Falls to continue to be a great community 10, 20, 50 years from now, we need to be planting seeds in the next generation of uh, business owners so that 20 years from now, we have the next poet, we have the next Dictronics, we have the next DocuTap, and that's what we're trying to do. I love it. Let's switch gears for a minute. You're both members of Downtown Rotary, so you're no stranger to the club's focus on mentoring. And you, you touched on it a little bit, Bree, um, about the mentoring program that's happening. I know I certainly be, wouldn't be where I am as a business owner without a really powerful group of mentors who helped me in so many different ways. Many of you are in this room, you know who you are. Uh, just last week when I was doing my mentoring session with my mentee through the program, I found myself saying something that one of my mentors 11 years ago said to me. And so that was kind of a fun moment that I just shared. <clears throat> what are you doing around mentorship? Yeah. Help this group kind of see that connection. Well, we've always valued mentorship, but we didn't really have a good mechanism in, to be able to coordinate that effort. And I give, a, I give a ton of credit to this organization as well as the city for creating an initiative that says we want to be a city of entrepreneurs, or a city, sorry, a city of entrepreneurs. We want to be that too, a city of mentors. Um, that just resonates with me personally and professionally. Um, again, in, in our industry, there are so many solo ventures out there where they just they need support. Beyond that, beyond those, those startups that we're already kind of engaging with, we see a disconnect at the university level mm -hmm. where I think some college age students and even younger than that don't, don't know where to plug in. Um, and we wanna be able to offer some opportunities to let them know um, that we are able to help engage them in that process. We want them to stay in our state, if anything else, but we'd love for them to, to relocate to our city. And a good example of that is this fantastic team of students down at USD, called, they're, they're called Femeno, that's the name of their app. Three women um, who went through the Holt Prize competition, which is an international competition. They had a chance to win a million dollars. They beat out teams from MIT and Harvard to get to the finals, the top 10, and they won $100,000. And she, when, I, when I contacted Bridget a while ago, when they hadn't, they hadn't found out that they won yet, she's like, I just, I don't know where to plug, you know, I, she, she was just as confused as anyone else. I'm like, you're brilliant. How can you not know where to go? And it's, it just takes somebody to kind of nudge you and say, guess what? You deserve a seat at this table. Mm -hmm. And I've had that opportunity myself. And I, that's all I ever want to do is share that same opportunity with others. We talk about DEI as a community. We've been talking about it a lot lately. I see Kira Kimball over there that's leading the charge in that area. Um, and that's really important to us as well to make sure that those that have some sort of a barrier to entry are able to utilize the resources as well, whether that's you know a, a language barrier or, or otherwise. Those are things that we're thinking about as well, which do relate to mentorship as well. We want to make sure that we have a diverse group of, of folks in our mentor, mentor network, both in industry and in background. Um, so yeah, mentorship is, is one of our, our staples. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without it. And Matt, when you think about the various young entrepreneurs you've mentored, what have you gained or learned from being a mentor to those entrepreneurs? Well, uh I wouldn't be where I am today without mentors in my life. I had three professors at Dakota State that really made just way, way too much time for me as a student and really made a big impact in my life. And, you know, I kind of feel like today, like if you are a person that has kind of the knowledge and time and expertise to help somebody, you kind of, you kind of have an obligation to do it because whether like you can think about it off the top of your head or not, somebody helped you get where you are today. And all of us in this room should, you know, I just understand that and say, okay, somebody help me. I need to help the next person. 
And, um, you know, for me, it's, I get a lot of, hey, you should go talk to Matt Paulson, like comments that get made. So then somebody will reach out to me. I, I met with Bridget like a week ago and she said, hey, I need to raise money for my business. How do I do that? And like, we had that conversation, uh, had a Zoom call with uh, a guy named Justin this morning on a construction company, wanted to know about marketing. So we chatted about that. Uh, just a ton of positive experiences. Uh, you know, they're not all great calls. You know, sometimes people you can give them advice and they don't follow or you can give them advice and uh, they do follow it and it doesn't work. Like it's, it's not the smooth, easy process that always kind of goes A to B to C to D, but you can make a positive impact on people's lives. And I just encourage everybody that has an opportunity to do that. And, you know, it's, it's really finding that mentorship opportunity that's right for you. Like I'm probably not the best guy to go into an elementary school and tell a second grader, like, how to be a great second grader. Uh, but startup founders, like, yep, send them my way. Let, let's yeah. chat. Like, ha happy to do that. So, you know, I think everybody in this room should be a mentor of some kind. It's just finding, you know, what is that opportunity for you that um, is rewarding for both the people you are mentoring and then you yourself as a mentor as well. One of our core values as an organization is authenticity. And that's, that's something that I see in Matt and so many others yeah. in our mentor network. We have to be able to have difficult conversations too. We can't just sugarcoat everything and say, oh, that's a great idea. You should quit your job. No, <laughs> no, we should not do that. Um, so we're, we're very intentional about that. And we, we, we're growing as a team in that, in that respect because it's hard to have tough conversations. It's hard to tell people the truth, but the more you do it, the better you get at it and the better it's gonna make another human being. So yeah. I, kudos to you for, for being that person in our, our network that's mm -hmm. able to Tell it like it is, and maybe not, maybe second graders aren't for you, Matt. You're no, right. I didn't know right. yourself, yeah. Matt. I, I, I taught yourself. vacation Bible school one year, and that was the one and only time I'll do that. Um, no, but uh, one thing about the Startups Who Follows Mentor Network that uh, I don't think that people will realize is like we have 30 mentors. Yeah. So we have attorneys, we have accountants, we have people that are branding and marketing specialists, uh, people across the board. So regardless of like what topic somebody needs help with, we've got somebody for them. So if you know anybody who's starting a business, just have them fill out the form on the website. Sarah will match them with the right person for them. And like, we've got more mentors than mentees right now. And we would love to have more mentees. So if, if you know anybody that could use some advice, send them to Startups Who Falls. 42 Whoa. mentors. You've been busy. Nice. Love it. Love it. And we've got two of them up here, which is pretty fun. Three of them. Three of them up here. Pretty fun. So I have one last question, but I'm going to save it at the end, which means we have a couple minutes for folks in the room who might have a question or two. I'd love to create that opportunity. And Eric, sorry, I didn't give you a heads up on that, but he looks ready. Who has a question for Matt or for Brianne or for either of them? Okay. Hi there, Steve Williamson. Uh, there's a lot of verbiage out there with our young folks about uh, why they should go on for a four-year education if they want to be an entrepreneur. Um, if you listen to people like Gary V and people like that out there, they say that going on for a four-year education is a waste of time and only where they'll get a lot of debt. First of all, is he wrong or is he right? And the second thing is, how do you go and counsel someone who comes out of college with student debt, which is a lot right now. Uh, the average South Dakota student comes out with about $35,000 of debt who wants to be an entrepreneur and how they go and access capital with a significant amount of student debt. Jeez, Steve. That's uh, starting off with a softball. So, so, so one thing I want to say about that is you look at people that are like the well-known college dropouts, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, maybe Steve Jobs. And the, uh, yeah, like none of them graduated college, but they also had like parents that could send them to like Harvard or Stanford. So they weren't like without resources or help. Uh, they had everything they need to kind of get going, um, even, even though they didn't like finish the college degree. Uh, there are a lot of people that aren't so fortunate. And you know, for people like myself that went through college and graduated, like I didn't have the money to go to college. I had to like work at a gas station to pay my tuition and worked at McDonald's to pay my tuition. Um, so I didn't have that capital and all those resources behind me, but I kind of learned a lot as a student. Um, I kind of got my stuff figured out and understood what I wanted to do when I grew up. And like, that's an important thing for, for people going you know college and know it's 
not right for everyone. And yes, college is too expensive. And yes, people take on too much debt with college, but like, I st still believe in college. Like it's, it's a valuable thing to a lot of people. Um, and you know, some people will start on first, you know, on, on third base, like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. And there are some people that will graduate with student loan debt and, um, you know, have to start from a situation where they are in debt. Um, and you know, there's not always an easy answer for those things. Uh, like if, if you have bad credit and you need money for a startup, it's like, sorry, I don't think I can help you. Um, and there's just not, not easy answers in those situations. But there are people that start from behind and get ahead. There are people that start ahead and get behind. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Telling it like it is. <laughs> Who's got another question? And it's a big one, Jason. It's the last one. You have to oh, yes. Introduce yourself, Jason. <laughs> yeah. Jason. Uh, question. Everything we're hearing here today and everything that we seem to be reading would indicate that Sioux Falls is getting it right when it comes to the startup community. But I suspect you guys have given this a lot of thought, and there are some things we're not getting right. Mm. What are we not getting right that we need to tackle soon? Mm. I know you have opinions about this. I do, but I just answered the last question. I know. <laughs> oh my goodness. What's one thing? And then Matt can cover one more thing. I think we're tackling it right now, but the thing that we're not getting right as an ecosystem is, is our location. Um, mm -hmm. we, we need to pivot. We need to be where we need to be more accessible. We need to be where the people are. And so we're making we're making moves in that regard to be more centrally located so that we're able to be more accessible to those that that can't currently connect with us beyond technology. So that would be one thing. Matt, what's another? Uh, I think we need more diverse sources of venture capital. Um, one, you know, we have venture capital firms in town, but they tend to be uh, very later stage. You know, Blue Stem primarily fo invest in like ophthalmology. Uh, businesses, uh, you know, McGowan Capital has done a lot of good over the years, uh, but they're not doing new deals. Um, Bird Dog Equity Partners has primarily moved into real estate. So there's, once you're kind of past the Falls Angel Fund stage, there's kind of a shortage of like, all right, where's that next, you know, we can find you the first quarter million, half million worth of capital. Where's that million dollar check? Where's that $2 million check going to come from? And right now we don't have a great answer to that. And, you know, that's something I've been spending a lot of time thinking about and thinking, you know, what is that opportunity to you know, solve that problem and kind of get people from the seed stage to maybe a series A kind of round for venture capital and, you know, trying to find some of that money and organize it and, um, you know, more to come there. I would also add, um, because we were just talking about universities and, and our engagement in that process, logistically, it's really difficult for us to engage with those universities that aren't here in town. And unfortunately, that means USD, SDSU, DSU, we have to try it harder to make sure that they know about us and we know about them. Um, so that's something that we're certainly working on and I don't have a good magic answer for how, how we fix that necessarily other than just more communication with one another um, and more efforts that, that can be made and, and us connecting and getting feedback from the students themselves to say, what do you see as challenges? Where, where can we help fill some gaps? Um, that would be something else that we need to work on. It's interesting. Yeah. All right. In 30 to 45 seconds, each of you, before we let you go, what's something this room should know that hasn't been asked yet today? Matt, you go first. You're putting me on the spot. Heck yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is a, it's a 20 year ball game that like is always like 20 years from being finished. So, you know, really what we try to do is just plant as many seeds as possible in people knowing that a lot of people may not be successful, but some of them will. And our goal is not necessarily like to launch the next big tech company out of South Dakota. It's really more how many seeds can we plant and how many different founders. And whether it's a mentor connection, getting them in co-starters, getting them connected to one million cups, like we want to make as many of those connection points as possible. And we know by doing that, good things will come from it. Round us off. And I would say that you're looking at two individuals that are incredibly passionate about what we do. We we'll hope you can you can feel that here today, um, and that we believe that acting on an idea can change the world. That that is truly something that resonates with us. And I just I, I know that the world is changing. That the entrepreneurial mindset has so much to offer so many people, 
And I guess if there was anything I, I would ask of you all is to take that into consideration, no matter what industry you're in. We're, we're trying to be as inclusive in this process as we can. And by that, I mean by industry as well. So if there's something that we can provide to you or you, us, to make our economy a stronger place, please reach out to us. Well, this was fun. I certainly love this topic. I hope everyone in the room enjoyed it as well. Help me thank our speakers today. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Matt, for your insights today. Uh, we were talking when the, before the program started that, uh, and I made the comment to all three of these, that I just don't have the guts uh, to, to start a business. Um, but I certainly recognize, um, um, I know everybody here recognizes the importance of the startup community. So please don't be shy about reaching out to the Downtown Rotary Club if uh, you guys need help pushing this, uh, this effort forward. All right, uh, next week, our program um, will be Meet the Sioux Falls Police Chief Candidates. Uh, we will be joined by Lieutenant Nick Cook and Lieutenant John Toom uh, for a very, very important conversation on who could potentially be our next police chief. So please join us next week, Monday. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.